you're sitting too far back. <laughs> there, I got it out. It took me courage to say it. Romans chapter 12, if you have your Bibles. And that was actually a very, very good video. And you, in your program, you have the, the, the um, title of the message, Hypnosis of Self-Deception. That was the message as of Tuesday of this past week. That is not the message as of Sunday of this week. Somewhere between Tuesday and Sunday, that got dramatically shifted to what I'm going to speak on today, biblical versus cultural Christianity. They asked me what I'm going to speak on on Tuesdays, and I think, well, then I'm going in this direction. But once I get on that road, and I find myself going on different directions after that direction, and, and so I ended up with a totally dev different message um, this morning, which I'm pretty excited about preaching, and there'll be a part two to this message in probably three, the next two or three weeks. <clears throat> Before the last election... I was speaking to a young man in the church, and, and we were in a meeting, we were talking about um, biblical versus cultural Christianity, and this young man walked by, and I said, who are you going to vote for? And he named a candidate that I wouldn't have named. <laughs> and I said, well, that, that's interesting. Um, why are you voting for him? Why do you think that he is the best candidate? And I want to see what he said, because from my Christian perspective, he wasn't the best candidate. Um, and this young man, and he was very good, he grew up in the church, he wasn't an unchurched person, he was a church person, he was born and raised within the church, and he went on to give me the different um, reasons why he wanted to vote for this individual. None of those reasons had anything biblical about them. Now, I'm not saying this in critique of the young man. He's actually here today. I'm going to point him out to you a little bit later. I'm uh, uh, only kidding. And, um, but he, um, but what, 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 what I grab from that conversation is, is, my Lord, he does not have a biblical worldview. He, he, he is basically um, looking in, in his political, he's 18, 19 years old, whatever he was, he's older than that, about 20, 21. And, and he, he had a CNN slash Fox News worldview that's what he had a time magazine newsweek worldview he his his flu, his the influence of his mind was not the word of god it was not his faith it was the world system around him and he was again he was a practicing believer one in ten professed christians according to chip Ingram, i believe it was live with a biblical worldview one in ten in other words, when I look at the world and I look at my life, I look at my money, my finances, my family, my relationships, my career, the political world, the educational world, I filter it through my Christian faith. One out of ten professing Christians filter life through their Christian faith. The other nine filter their life through the world. The media, the, the prevailing spirit of the age, which is what the word cosmos means in the, in, the, in the Greek New Testament. John Stott, some of you who have ever heard of John Stott, great, he's still alive, he's probably in his 70s now. He's a great commentator, reformed commentator from England. He's pastoring um, one of the old famous churches there in England. And he's semi-retired, he travels around quite a bit. And he's investigating, he was coming to America and, and looking at um, different churches, some of the most successful churches in America. I actually have a couple studies like that I'm going to bring up today. He said there was evangelism like never before in the church. And I would agree with him. I mean, there's amazing evangelism going on. There's new churches being planted everywhere um, and with amazing evangelistic fruit. The seeker movement of the, of the early 90s had, had amazing evangelistic fruit. But when they launched a 15-year study after the fact, and they, and they, and they tried to um, de determine the spiritual maturity and the spiritual climate of all these conversions they had over a decade and a half, they realized that spiritual maturing didn't happen. Discipleship never took place. And as to finish Stott's quote, she says, the greatest need in the church is no longer evangelism, but a spiritual maturity and a plan for discipleship in our churches. There are three Bibles average for every home in America. We have an application problem. We don't have a scarcity of the word. I put the average up. I have about 25. <laughs> so I can probably shift, you know, give, give a few away, but I'm not going to. 
<laughs> and, and, um, um, and we have an application problem. There's three Bibles. But we don't have a Christian worldview. There is a crisis of discipleship. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 said this. And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That happens to me a lot when people look at me. They, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Wow. Which is what they know is these guys don't have a lot on the ball here. They're not, you know, they just fish them into this and that. He goes, but there's something different. These men had been with Jesus. I want to read you Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. These are our key verses here for the next couple of weeks. And, and, you know, I hear a lot of terms out there called recovery, recovery. And there's a lot of recovery groups out there, 12-step recovery groups. And I'm, I'm not against those things. I'm really not. But I just want to take the word recovery and replace it with the word transformation. I just like transformation better than recovery because transformation means I, I'm being transformed into something brand new. And recovery means I'm always digging myself out of the pit. But, I, but at some point, I want to see my life is out of the pit. <laughs> I want to see my life is healed and transformed. And I want to see myself as a new creature, not necessarily somebody just trying to get by and survive. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. That's the key word, therefore. Remember that word because I'm going to, I'm going to refer back to that a little bit later on in the message. That word, therefore, looks back. Therefore, is a look over the shoulder. In other words, in other words, it says this, in light of what I've already shared, in light of what I've already written, therefore, and then we're going we're gonna to go back on that in a moment, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, that's that word world, that word cosmos, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it says, be ye not, be not transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. So it, it, we look at this, okay, that's, a, that's an incredible verse. That's an incredible exhortation. How does it work? How do we get there? Well, Romans 12 wasn't the first chapter in Romans. There were 11 chapters before it. And we want to, you have to sort of map your way to get to Romans chapter 12. There's a process to getting here. And we're going to see that in a moment. But before I do that, before I know how to be transformed and become like Christ and present myself as a living sacrifice, I have to understand what was sacrificed for me. That's my first premise. That's my foundational premise. Now, you know the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He was, he was um, at the burning bush. You know, Moses grew up in the Pharaoh's house, um, didn't like what was happening, took off in the wilderness, married his, his wife, and f spent 40 years to sort of settle down being a shepherd in the wilderness. He he's walking to sheep one morning, and there's a bush in flames. He goes and investigates, and God speaks to him through the burning bush with a voice something like Charlton Heston's. He said, Moses. And, um, and Moses said, what? And, um, and, and then they had this conversation. He goes, go set my people free. That's, that's in a King James God from the Cesar de Mill. Go set my people free. And, and Moses said, hey, you know, God, I stutter. Aaron's a good preacher. I'm a good shepherd. Um, why don't you get Aaron and I'll, and I'll, I'll carry his briefcase. But, but, his, um, but Aaron's the guy for the job, not me. So Moses, no, it's you. I want you to do it. Oh, good God. So I'm just going to walk in to Egypt and say, set my people free and keep my head. And then, what, then he said this, what do I tell the Israelites? Why should they follow me? Who is it that sent me? And then this is where yet the famous um, verse, often quoted verse in verse 14 of Exodus 3. And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now that I am, as you know, in the Hebrew language is that word Yahweh, an a, a unutterable word in the Hebrew culture. They don't, because it, it was so holy. The word denotes self-existent. 
eternal and incomprehensible nature of Yahweh as the only original being. He is the ground of all created being. Charles Ryrie says this, for today it means that, talking about Yahweh, for today it means that God is all I need for every circumstance and twist of life. That's a great definition. Yahweh, I'll, I'll repeat on Ryrie again, today it means that God is all I need for every circumstance and twist of life. The Companion Bible says of this, what, what he will be is left to be filled up according to the needs of those with whom he is in covenant with. In other words, he's saying, whatever the needs of those who he's in covenant with, Yahweh will be that for them. Whatever needs I have, Yahweh is my need meter. He will come through and my needs are going to be different. My needs will be different than your needs and your needs and your needs. But Yahweh is the same to all of us. He will be my, my need meter. I have some wonderful commentaries in my home library. I have some um, rabbinic commentaries. And I, re I looked at this verse up years ago in that. And one of the, one of the um, um, rabbis said, it's a blank check from God. Sort of like this. This is a check that's been in my pocket for a while. It's a little, it's a little wrinkle. Let me see. I, let me see if this is a little measure. I'm sorry. I'm going to leave the scam for a minute. I need my pen. I can't write out a check. Who even knows how to write out a check anymore? This isn't just a slide your card right now, right? We don't have that. If I had a debit card this big, I just would use a debit card. But it wouldn't have the, the, same, the same thing. I'm not going to write the, the whole thing. I'll pay the order of Tim Kelly. Bug. This is really good because my wife never lets me do this. <laughs> This is Yahweh. I should have wrote that in. Tim, there it is. I have a blank check. God gives me a blank check. I fill it in. This is my name, Tim Kelly. Um, how much is it? As much as I need. Signed by God. That's me. So I can take this to the bank. What do I need? Well, I, I need affirmation i get it from god i need acceptance i i get it from god i'm facing um maybe financial issues where do i go i go i go to god um i need to be healed from wounds in my past where do i go well i have a blank check from yahweh yahweh says that he will come through for me and be everything i need him to be he's saying this to the jews it applies to me and, and as the church of christ so i i have a i have a blank check the problem with most Christians, many Christians, we never cash to check. We look for some other source of revenue to get our needs met. We look to other sources of revenue to be fulfilled. I'm going to be fulfilled through a human being or, or relationship or through having more real money or um, through career, through affirmation, through um, commendation, through being patted on the back, through being fame and fortune. Whatever that is, I'm looking for these things to be Fulfill. So this is this in a sense. This is this is Yahweh. I have a blank check from God. I need to understand that. Let me. That way you can see it. Again, it was in my pocket, so it was a little wrinkled. Um, I need to understand that if I'm going to um, understand um, discipleship, I, I must start here. That everything I have and can lay claim to is going to be something that comes from Him. Not going to be something I produce within myself. It's going to be something he produces within me. So by the mercies of God, he says, I present my body as a living sacrifice. Now, in mercies, what's he referring to? Well, mercies sort of go back to the word therefore again. Here the word mercy denotes undeserving kindness or compassion. And the plural is used to imitate the Hebrew word for mercy, which doesn't know any singular form. It's always plural in the Hebrew. That particular word, anyway. And so it, it looks back, and it's talking about the, the kindness, compassion, and undeserving. So, uh, uh, things of God. So it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the kindness of God, the, under, uh, the being undeserving before God, or the compassion of God, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So what's the apostle saying? He goes, I'm, he's reaching back. Well, where's the mercies of God? Well, it starts in Romans 1, and 1, 1 through 3. In Romans 1, chapter 1, chapter 1, and chapter 2, and chapter 3, it, in a nutshell, in a bird's eye view, we're lost in sin. We are absolutely hopeless. We are absolutely powerless. We're 100% depraved, and we cannot help ourselves, and we cannot pull ourselves out of it. That's the good news of Romans um, chapter 1, 2, and 3. Now, it, it, it's a little bit, if I stopped there, that would be a little bit discouraging, but I'm not going to stop there. But that in itself, if I'm going to understand real freedom and deliverance, I must detach myself and my own strength and my own energies and my own wisdom and my own willpower. I have to detach myself from the formula. Because as much as I'm involved in my own transformation, the slower it will be. So my recovery, my transformation starts with my understanding that I don't have a blank. My blank check's from God. It isn't from myself. I don't write myself out a check. I get what I get from God. My transformed life is from God. My needs are met through Christ. My affirmation is through Christ. My acceptance is through Christ. My healing is through Christ. And any good work in me or any good work through me or any good work for me is absolutely 100% the grace and the mercy of God. Not some barter system. So run through, now we go to Romans 4 and 5. God has a solution. Here, I'm a mess. Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. But Romans 4 and 5, God has a solution. Die, Jesus died on the cross. He paid for my sins and those sins of the entire world. He was my reconciler to God. My sins. All those things that separated me from the Father. All those things that hindered me in my day-to-day -day walk with God. My sins. That's individual acts and that's the whole old nature of man. The whole fallen nature of man. That, that, that we're dead, Ephesians 2, 1, and our trespasses and sins. Those things are separating from a God. Jesus took on that need. This is, I love this illustration or this, this perspective. God in eternity, He sees human need he sees human depravity he sees romans chapter one two and three he looks at the, the the ramifications and the effects that sin has had on the human race what am i going to do as a solution i have to give the human race hope i have to how do i fix the problem that they brought upon themselves through eating of the tree in the garden well, my plan is, is profound. And that my plan is orchestrated by my wisdom. It was motivated by my love. And it was carried out by my power. And the plan is this. My cross. My cross is God's answer. That every one of every human of every man and woman's needs Romans 4 and 5 but he doesn't stop there now we have a new life Romans 6 through 8 we have as we brought out a few weeks ago we we identify when Jesus died I died with him um, and, and when he when he when he resurrected I resurrected with him when he ascended Ephesians 2 6 I ascended with him um, and, and I, now my positional standing is with Christ in the heavenly places. Well, what happens if I sin? Romans chapter 7. Well, I go to Romans chapter 8. Therefore, now there is no con condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do I live this life? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a new government inside of me, the government of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 verse 2. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. The law of sin and death, the governing power the govern of, of sin and death that used to reign in me was the, it now has been supplanted by the law of life. Romans 6 through 8. Then we go to Romans chapter 9. talks about God's, God's people, the Jews, 9 through 11. The Jews, what about those promises to the Jews? Well, as one person said, the Jews sort of fumbled the ball a little bit. They missed the Messiah, who was Jesus. These promises will be realized... But for now, it's you and I, the church. 
that has Jews in it and Gentiles in it and everything in between. A bunch of mongrels. The church of Jesus Christ. A new, a new race of people called the church. Now, we're ready for discipleship. We understand Romans 1 through 11. Now we're ready. Therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the word surrendered. The word surrendered is in the, in the Webster's Dictionary. It, says it means to be yielded or delivered to the power of another. To be resigned or given up to. My friends, when we surrender our lives to God, it is a life changer. God gave me a blank check. Whatever you need from me, I'll be. Now I want to I challenge us all. Here's the key to transformation. I have another blank check. Spelled my name wrong. This is the me, myself, and I. This is the name of the bank. The me, me myself, and I bank. I write a blank check to God. What do I, what's, what's in my life? And I give it over, I sign it over to him. He surrendered a, his assets to me. He surrendered his life to me. He said, whatever you need me to be, his power to me. And this is the key to my transformation. I take my life and I give it back. God, do with me as you would do with me. God, I'm giving you a blank check, just like you gave me a blank check. I'm giving you control over my relationships. I'm giving you control over my schedule, over my resources. God, I, God I'm giving you control over my finances. I'm giving you control over my past. I'm giving you control over how I was brought up as a young child. I, I'm giving you control over the poor relationships that were abusive to me for may, maybe many years. I'm giving you control over the trauma that I knew as a, as a young person or even as an older person. I'm giving you control over my grief, my heartache, my pain, my loss. I'm giving you control. I'm surrendering my life. I'm writing you, God, a blank check. What do you want from me? I won't speak much, much longer here, but I just want to talk about what is surrender and what is discipleship. I'm using them almost interchangeably. First of all, please understand that it's not doing stuff. It's not getting busy. It's not like, all right, I'll teach nursery. Well, actually, it is that. <laughs> just kidding but it's, um, it, it's not those it's not, it's not Christian activity discipleship is an issue of the heart it's something that goes on inside of you that will work its way out to the outside but it starts on the inside it grows on the inside and puts roots down on the inside it's not Christian activity it's not even Christian behavior per se that could be a, a indicator of discipleship but it might not be. The word disciple is the word manthanos. Many of you know that. It's an old, old word, um, Greek word. And it means student or learner. But one of the nuances of manthanos is, is deeper than that. It's not only if I was here to teach you physics, I'd be your teacher. And you'd be my student. And I would teach you all that I know about physics, which I don't know anything about it. But if I, if I was, I would teach you. And you'd be, my, in a sense, my disciple. But this word is more rich than that, manthanos. Manthanos means that I reflect 
the one who discipled me. I reflect their character. I reflect their nature. I reflect their, their, their convictions. I, I, I become, I, I, I watch them as my example. I want to be like them. And so I'm a disciple of Jesus. Not only do I reflect his teachings, which is obviously incredibly important, but I deflect, I reflect his demeanor. I reflect his personality. I reflect how he treated people. His passions, his love, how he laid down his life, how he, um, he, he touched a leper. I, I reflect on these things. See, that's what discipleship means. I copy the one that, I, that I'm saying is my teacher. So the first thing we want to surrender is we need to, we need to have an abandonment to redemption. This is Oswald Chambers talk. I thought this was a brilliant statement he might make. He says, belief in redemption is difficult because it needs self-surrender first. In other words, I, we talk a lot about redemption here. We talk a lot about the cross. We talk a lot about the finished work of Christ and the exchange life gospel and the different ways we may, may phrase it here. But the first place I want to surrender is there. I want to surrender to the cross. I want to surrender to the work of the cross for me. See, some of us never surrender there. We understand the cross. Mechanically, we understand what Jesus did on the cross. But I don't surrender my life to the cross. I don't surrender my life to the identity the cross wants to give me. I don't surrender my life to the transformation the cross wants to give me. I don't surrender my life to an identity, the identity that the cross wants to give me. I say, no, I'm, I, know I'm, I know I'm blood bought. I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. I know I'm sealed with the Spirit. But I'm going to still use my past as my identity. I'm going to use that person's offense as my identity. I'm going to use my poor childhood as my identity. I'm going to use that traumatic event as my identity. So what have I done really? I have not surrendered to the cross. When I've surrendered to the cross and say, God, you are my identity. You're my thoughts. You're my past. You're who I am. You're my present. You're my future. I'm giving everything in my life, past, present, and future, to your ministry towards me, to your blank check towards me. Well, pastor, isn't that the easy way out? It's the only way out. Doesn't God, does God get glorified that way? He gets incredibly glorified that way because He's the only one that can do it. It was His cross, not mine. He opened the door. I didn't open it. He opened the door. That's why in Ephesians 2, 7 it says, For the ages to come that He may show the exceeding riches of His grace. Amazing verse. The ages to come, talking about the future state. I'm going to show the exceeding riches of your grace. Well, what do you mean by that? Simple. You are the exceeding riches of His grace. The church. Here we are walking through the streets of gold as the exceeding riches of God's grace. The angels look at us and say, there's God's grace on the streets of gold. What's walking down the street? God's grace. I thought His name was Tim Kelly. It is. But it's God's grace that He's here. So we submit ourselves to, to um, um, redemption. We surrender ourselves to redemption. Surrender is an unending but imperfect desire to fellowship with God. It's the giving up of self. It's the giving up of self-analysis, self-critique, self-judgment. It's just giving up self and becoming occupied with Christ and the things of God. It's probably a little harder than I made it, huh? But that's what it is. God, I don't want to use myself, not only what I want from myself, but what I need from myself. In other words, whatever that internal need that we all have, and they're all different for all of us, I'm just relinquishing all these things. I'm surrendering these things. Transform me. Make me who you want to make me. Because we know in Romans 8.29... That your ultimate goal for all of us is that we'll be conformed to the image of your son. This is a great word that you find in Christian circles. When you type it into your word document, you'll come up with a little red line under it because it doesn't exist in the dictionary. But it does exist in some of the Christian books and the commentaries. This is a word called Christ-likeness. 
And that's the ultimate goal of discipleship. We become little undeified Christ represented in the world. Sinners, yes. We fail, yes. We fall short of the glory of God regularly. <laughs> but we become little, little representations of Jesus Christ on earth. Not just his words where we pound people over the head with the word of God, but his character, his nature, his love, his compassion, his brokenness. And we become a purveyor of this message. This blank check that God has given us. Listen, I can't write this check out if he didn't write this check out. Because he wrote this check out, I can write this check out. If I want to be like him, and I do, then I just got to give it up. God, take my life. Do what you will. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my habits. I'm giving you my, my addictions. I'm, give, I'm just giving it. I'm not saying I'm going to be delivered over tomorrow night, but I'm, give, I'm giving you everything, God. Take control of my life. I surrender all. Dear Jesus, thank you.